Williams, how about we get you a cup? How's that? That'd be just fine. I understand. Okay? Yeah, that'd be just fine. Those with uh, still cameras um, during the testimony, once we get started, got to be on silent shutter. Okay. The other thing is, um, while there's testimony going on or opening statements or or whatever, can't have any movement around. You know, between witnesses or whatever, that's fine. We'll, let you move and give you a little time, okay? All right. Ready for the jury? Sure, Your Honor. All right, let's go. All rise. Yes, please take your seats. Maybe may be seated. jury. Um, let me um, reiterate to you what uh, we're about to uh, have now is the opening statements by the people. And um, as I had indicated to you earlier, the opening statements of the attorneys are designed for them to explain to you what they believe the evidence is going to show. The opening statement kind of gives you a road map of what each side thinks the case may be. But I want you to understand that the opening statement is not evidence. The evidence that you will use as the basis for your decision will be the answers that come from the witness stand and any physical exhibits that are received and anything else that I may tell you during the course of the trial that you may consider as evidence. So with that, we'll begin with the opening statement. Uh, Mr. Moran. Thank you, Your Honor. <coughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thursday, March 5th of 2015, uh, was an ordinary evening in the Berg household. It was a Thursday. Um, Terrence Berg and his wife, Anita, were home with their teenage son, Teddy. And Teddy had someone over, a friend of the family, helping him do his homework. And that friend um, uh, was a, a reporter for the Free Press, happened to be a reporter at that time, was helping him with his friend's homework. Nothing unusual about the evening. They had dinner. The friend of the family was helping him do his homework, and she left. As she's leaving, the judge and his wife live on Oak Drive in the city of Detroit, on the northwest side. As she's leaving, Judge Bird decides to walk her to her car. He walks to her car. Her car is parked on the street. He says goodnight. As he's walking back into his house, he realizes that his garbage cans are out in front of his house. And he decides at that time to take his garbage cans back, to drag them back into the, the, the side of the house where they belong. So he goes to the front of the house on Oak Drive, takes both garbage cans, one in each hand, and drags them behind him uh, across the drive, across the sidewalk. There's snow and there's ice, and it's making quite a noise as he's dragging his trash can. He puts them on the side of his house. His house is situated, and you'll see, on the corner of Kalita Street and Oak Drive in the city of Detroit. He lives on the corner. He walks 
to the side, deposits the trash cans, and realizes that he doesn't have the key to the gate to put the trash cans in the backyard, so he just leaves them on the side of the house. Walks down the side of the street toward the front of his house, and as he does, he passes two individuals and says, hi, hello, how are you? And then he continues to walk up his front porch. As he gets close to his front porch, he notices or hears someone behind him. He turns, and he sees two individuals standing very close in proximity to him. One is standing right next to him by the front porch, and the other is a few feet away standing by the tree in the front yard, which you will see. The person standing next to him follows him up onto the front porch and says, excuse me, sir, um, we just want to go inside. And Judge Berg realizes what's about happening and says, no, no. He knows that inside that house is his wife and his teenage son. He puts his arms out and says, no, you're not going in. The individual on the porch is the defendant, Mr. Smith. When Judge Berg puts out his arms and says, no, the defendant takes out a 45 caliber handgun from his pocket, points at the judge, and pulls the trigger one time, hitting him in his leg. He's three feet away from Terrence Burke when he fires that shot. As that shot rings out, the defendant and the co-conspirator who's with him, his name is Robert Williams, who's standing on the sidewalk, they run away. The robbery is not complete. They run away. As they're running away, Judge Berg falls in the front porch and starts to scream for help. His wife inside is doing dishes. She hears the scream. She comes outside, sees her husband lying on the porch bleeding. She's screaming for her son to call 911. There's a ruckus in the neighborhood. Neighbors are coming over. People are calling the police to see what happens. Luckily, a neighbor from right in the same area is a doctor. And the doctor comes over and renders first aid to the judge that is lying on the front porch. They apply a tourniquet. They try to stop the bleeding. The police are called. And you're going to hear the 911 call where Mrs. Uh, Anita Sevier, who is the judge's wife, calls 911. And she's in a panic. She's trying to get someone to come and help her, her husband, who is a federal district court judge. And she says that. I don't know if this is related to his work. I don't know if this is a robbery. But send help. Call the marshals. And you're going to learn the marshals uh, are the U.S. marshals. Their job is to protect federal judges. And she's telling them he's a judge send the marshals. We don't know what's involved. <coughs> the police come. The police, the Detroit police arrive in a matter of minutes. They assess the situation and realize we can't wait for an ambulance. We have to do something. And they load him in the back of a scout car. And they drive him to the hospital. The doctor who's rendering aid goes with them to the hospital and renders aid. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the facts in this case about what happened on March 5th, of 2015. Not complicated, not difficult to comprehend. They're going to show that at that time, during the course of a robbery of Judge Berg, he was shot by the defendant. And at the time he possessed that gun, he was not authorized to uh, carry a firearm because he has a prior felony conviction. What Judge Berg did not know at that time was the fact that he is one of many victims of the defendant. One of many. Many victims who have been robbed for a period of time. And you're going to see throughout the course of this case you're going to see some of the evidence. This is the house where Judge Bird lives with his wife and his, and his teenage son on Oak Drive in Clearwater Street in the city of Detroit. You're going to see photographs from the crime scene. This is the front of the house as it appeared that night. And on the porch is the 45 caliber handgun casing that's left behind when the defendant fires that gun into the judge's leg. As I was saying, what the judge did not know at that time was that he is one of many victims one of many victims of the defendant and others. What he did not know at that time, and what was not revealed until very recently, was that between January and May of last year, January and May of last year, the defendant and others had entered into an agreement, entered into a conspiracy to commit robbery. They, the defendant and others, have decided that they are going to commit robberies as a way to make a living. They're going to rob people. And it doesn't matter if you're in your home, in your car, at your business, those are the individuals that they're going to target. They rob people at houses, they rob people in their homes, they rob people in their cars, they rob people at their stores. Whatever they can do to make money, they're going to do that. And part of that conspiracy doesn't stop there. Part of that conspiracy is to get those proceeds from the robberies, whether it's jewelry or items of electronics that are worth money, and then to pawn them at pawn shops. Other part of the robbery is to get cash from individuals or get ATM cards 
or get debit cards and go immediately to an ATM in, in the near the vicinity and withdraw money. And you're going to see that evidence. You're going to see the defendant on video withdrawing money from a victim's credit card that was just robbed. You're going to hear that this conspiracy involves the defendant, Kevin Smith. It involves some of his friends. One is Robert Williams, also known as Nunu. He is, he is a co-conspirator. And he's going to testify. We'll talk about that in a moment. Another individual is by the name of Timothy Russell. Timothy Russell was also a co-confederate, a co-conspirator of the defendant. Um, he was involved in some of these robberies. You're going to hear his name, Timothy Russell. Another individual you're going to hear about is Don Diego Adams. Don Diego Adams is a fourth person that was part of this conspiracy. And you're going to hear his name often. In fact, you're going to see his face as he's going to testify. He's going to tell you about his involvement. And one of his involvements was to, to go and pawn a lot of the items, the jewelry, the, uh, the electronics, whatever loot they were able to take from the victims to pawn shops. And he was the one responsible for pawning the items. And there's, a, there's a fifth person who you're also going to hear about by the name of uh, Alan Corbin. And his involvement is much lower than the defendants and the other participants, but he's also involved in this conspiracy. So back in January of uh, last year, they got together and decided that instead of getting a job, it's easier to rob people. And one of the, th the theories about this robbing people is that it's easier to rob someone than it is to break into their home. Because if you break into their home to commit a home invasion, that's dangerous. Because the defendant could get hurt. You don't know who's behind the door. But if you walk someone into their house and they, call, they phrase these calls, they phrase these crimes, walk-ins. Because they walk someone from outside their house to inside their house. Then you control the situation. And they're going to tell you that they target a particular kind of individual. Senior citizens. Elderly, because they have money, they have cash, and they're vulnerable. And that's why they pick their victims. Someone who is opportunist and someone who is vulnerable. So the term walk-ins is part of this robbery. It doesn't stop this conspiracy. It doesn't stop there. They conspired to do businesses. They robbed a jewelry store. They robbed a dollar store. It involves carjackings and attempts to rob people in their cars. And you'll hear evidence about that. And you're going to see evidence about that, that corroborates what they say. So how do you prove a conspiracy? Judge Kenny gave me the instructions on what I'm required to prove. And he basically told you the law uh, that a conspiracy is an agreement with someone else to do an illegal act. That's basically what an agreement is, uh, a conspiracy is. So how do you prove that? It's not like when you buy a car or buy a house and you sign a bunch of papers and you sign your name to it. The defendant and his friends didn't get together and have a notarized signature or document saying we're conspiring to commit robberies. So how do we prove they had an agreement to commit robberies? Well, you ever hear the expression, actions speak louder than words? So you're going to hear about actions speaking louder than words. You're going to hear about their conduct, but you're also going to hear about their words, too. You're going to hear the words spoken by the defendant. You're going to hear the words spoken by the co-defendants. And you're going to see the actions that they participated in during the course of this conspiracy. That's how we are going to show the conspiracy. But before we get to that, we need to show that there actually is an association between the individuals. So in order to corroborate the fact that they knew each other, you're going to see a lot of photographs. Photographs taken from the defendant's phone, from his Facebook account, from um, aspects along those lines. And on, on the screen, you're going to see three of the co-defendants, three of the co-conspirators, the defendant in the middle, Robert Williams, a.k.a. Nunu, and Timothy Russell. A photograph documenting that three of them are Confederates. You're going to see a photo other photographs, like this photograph of the defendant along with Timothy Russell. And I'd ask you to pay particularly close attention in this photograph to the clothing that they're wearing, because we'll come back to that in a few moments. It's very important. I told you you're going to hear about the words that the defendant used to express his concerns about how we're going to prove he was conspiring with someone. And the way we're going to do that, one way, is by his text messages. One text message that he sends says, I'm, I'm going to hit a lick. Now, hit a lick is phrase for commit a robbery. And here he is talking about trying to get access to someone's car. And one of the themes you're going to hear about this conspiracy is they have to have someone drive them around. Because the defendant doesn't have a car at that point. Um, so they used other people. They used Don Diego Adams' uh, girlfriend's car. They used Timothy Russell's sister's car. They used Timothy Russell's sister sometimes to do these, rob to do these robberies. So there's going to be a discussion in these text messages about trying to get transportation to and from a robbery. But in this one in particular, this is in January, the defendant's own text message says, I'm going to hit a lick. I'm going to commit a robbery. That's what that means. Another text message. He sends this one in January. He says, <coughs> bring the mask tomorrow. Don't forget, the mask. Because you're going to learn in the course of these robberies when these senior citizens, these elderly people are in their homes, the defendants don't show up 
completely up with their faces uncovered, they're wearing masks partially covering their face sometimes. Here in January, the defendant's own words indicate that he's saying, don't forget to bring the mask tomorrow. Another expression. He says, where are the shells at? Grab the mag and the shell. Get the magazine and the bullets for the gun. Because an empty gun doesn't help you when you're planning a robbery. So, ladies and gentlemen, these are the defendant's own text messages describing his involvement in a conspiracy, the planning phase of committing robberies. And you'll see evidence like this during the course of this case. You're going to see other text messages where he says, Little Diego got the car? No? Well, bring the hammers, guns. Uh, I may have to get my mama's car then. Again, discussion about Don Diego Adams' car or discussions about guns they're using during the course of a robbery. So you're going to see evidence that the defendant from his own mouth says some text messages planning to commit these robberies. Talking about guns, talking about ammunition, talking about masks. You're also going to see photographs from his own phone where he has access to firearms. Here are pictures from his own phone with the defendant holding in his hand a gun with a laser point from his own phone. Pictures of himself with a gun. But more than that, ladies and gentlemen, it was a robbery that took place on April 15th, and you're going to hear about this, in 2015 on Hilldale Street, which is the same street the defendant lives on, involving Mr. and Mrs. Stewart. And they, Mr. Stewart was coming home. It was late at night. Mrs. Stewart was upstairs in her bed, I believe, quilting or knitting. And the defendant and others came into the house with guns and masks. And they robbed them. They robbed them of their credit cards, their ATMs, of jewelry, their iPad, of their cell phone, of uh, a necklace that Mr. Stewart was wearing, and they left. And you're going to hear that not only are you going to see the defendant cashing, or trying to cash, uh, get the ATM card from the defendant, I'll show you that in a moment, but the defendant <coughs> has pleaded guilty to that armed robbery. He's already pleaded guilty to committing that armed robbery during the course of this conspiracy. So through his own mouth, again, not only text messages, but his own mouth that he assisted someone else in committing a robbery in April, right in the middle of this conspiracy. Now, the co-defendants involved in this case, other than the defendant, you're going to hear evidence are Timothy Russell, Robert Williams, and Kevin Smith. And these are locations of their houses on the west side of Detroit. And, I'm sorry. These are locations of the robberies that occur in the vicinity. And you can see the vicinity of their houses and the vicinity of the robberies are in close proximity to one another. And there are a number of them. Conspiracy starts in January. It starts with a dollar store robbery in January. Then it goes to uh, a house on, La on LaSalle Street. Then it goes to another house on Mansfield. Another house on Oak Drive where Judge Berg is shot. Then to another house on Grixdale on April 19th. Then on Hilldale, the one the defendant is really guilty for, April 15th. <coughs> Then there's the one on Irene, where a husband and wife and their special needs son is robbed in their own home. Then the one on Asbury Park. This is not a house robbery. This is a uh, attempted carjacking and robbery of a couple that are sitting in a car. Then there's a robbery on Faust. Now, this is an interesting robbery that takes place on Faust on May 11th because the defendant is not there. You're going to hear Robert Williams and Don Diego Adams talk about how this is a robbery they did and the defendant did not participate. It's part of the conspiracy because they, part, they participated, you'll see the text messages about that and the planning about that, but he just didn't go along for that. You're going to hear about a shooting that takes place on Ward Street on May 16th. This is an attempt at carjacking, where in that case, the victim, sitting inside a Dodge Durango, drives away before the defendant and Robert Williams can rob them or carjack them. And what does the defendant do? He shoots at them. What does Robert Williams do? He shoots at them, and they get away. And lastly, you're going to hear about a robbery that takes place toward the end of the conspiracy that happens in Roseville at a jewelry store. And you're going to hear testimony from Mr. Williams that this is part of the robbery, uh, part of the conspiracy that they plan to commit as they're going along committing these robberies. Let's start talking a little bit about some of the robberies in general. This first one on the, that we're talking about is one on Mansfield. And this is a situation where the elderly woman comes home. She's, a, she's, a, she's robbing her driveway, taking her house. Items are taken, including an ATM card. And true to the form of the robbery, you're going to see that this is the location of the house, Mrs. Stewart's house, and there are two businesses, a, 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 a dollar, I'm sorry, a liquor store and a gas station. And here they are. And shortly after the robbery takes place, there are bank withdrawals 
and look at the particular individual walking in both businesses and the clothing that they're wearing. Look familiar? It's very similar to the jacket that Mr. Uh, Russell was wearing that day. The boots, the jeans, the jacket are the same. Can't see his face. But this is right after the robbery takes place and you'll see the, you'll see the time stamps that occur in that situation. The next robbery I want to talk to you about takes place on Hilldale Street. And I spent some time talking about this. This is January 15th. And this situation occurs where the, the husband is coming home on Hilldale Street, right down the street from the defendant leaves, lives. And he's robbed. And the wife is robbed in their own home. And then moments after the robbery takes place, there's a PNC bank located on Woodward, just right up the street from the location of this robbery, of the victim's house. And then there's gas stations on the northwest side of Detroit, farther away. We'll get to those in a minute. Shortly after the robbery takes place, in fact, while the robbery is still going, you're going to hear testimony that the defendant left the house, got into a car, drove to the PNC while his co-conspirators are still in the house committing the robbery, and he withdraws money using the victim's ATM card at that PNC bank. And these are the photographs that are taken from the PNC bank of the defendant withdrawing money from the steward's account. Remember that jacket? The Nike jacket the defendant is wearing? That's not only in this photograph, it's not only in the photograph of the ATM, but we recovered that in the search warrant. We're going to see that as evidence as well. Recover that evidence from the search warrant. Later on that day, after that AT the, B B the, the PNC uh, money is withdrawn, then they go back to a house. Mr. Smith gives his coat to, to Robert Williams Nunu, and he says, go get, some more, go get some more money. And he gets in the car with Benicia, and they go to two or three different locations on the northwest of Detroit, and, and Mr. Williams is wearing the defendant's coat. This is him in those gas stations, attending ATM withdrawals on the northwest side of Detroit wearing the same coat as the defendant was wearing just moments before when he was withdrawing those from the PNC bank. Fowl Street, May, May 11th. This is a situation where an elderly man, a gentleman was coming home. He was coming home from, I think, a book reading or a, a book club. He's accosted in the driveway as he's walking in his door and two people come in. And he says that two people come in um, and one of them has a gun with a laser pointer on it. One of them has a gun with a laser pointer on now, I told you that the defendant was not there. And Robert Williams, who's going to testify, and Don Diego Adams is going to testify, he was not part of this robbery. He did not go to this robbery, but it's part of the conspiracy. It's still part of the agreement to rob people. And these are the co-conspirators acting along in this robbery. And Mr. Mr. Uh, Rooster, who is the victim of this house, is going to tell you that as he's going to his house, he's accosted, the individual comes in with a, with a laser pointer, and they force him to the ground, they cut the cord to a, uh, to a lamp, they tie him up on the ground, and they rob him. They take his television, they take some change, uh, they take some credit cards, they take whatever they can get from the defendant, the victim in that case. And then sh true to form, shortly thereafter on Livernoy, which is just not too far from the location of Mr. Rooster's house, we see a co-conspirator in this case attempting to make ATM withdrawals. Now Mr. Rooster is smart, and before he calls the police, he calls the bank to cancel his credit cards before he calls 911 because he knows someone's going to go withdraw money. So the first call he makes is to cancel his credit cards, to cancel his ATM card. So when this individual, who will later learn is Timothy Russell, is trying to withdraw this money from the ATM, he doesn't, he's not successful because he doesn't get the money. But you see what he's wearing, and it's very distinctive. Take a look at that, if you would. Take a look at the shirt that he's wearing in the lower left-hand corner. He's wearing a red, white, and blue shirt covered up by a hoodie, trying to obscure his face, short pants, and tim Timberland boots. Same picture outside, same picture inside uh, of this surveillance video. A, a rather distinctive looking photograph. And you're going to find that that same shirt was on his Facebook page. There is a picture of Timothy Russell wearing the same shirt that he, that he wore on these two ATM withdrawals on his Facebook page. And not only was it on his Facebook page, which identifies him as possibly being involved in these robberies, but during a search warrant execution, it was recovered from his house. That is a co-conspirator of the defendant, Mr. Russell, doing what the conspiracy was part of, robbing people, <coughs> withdrawing money, and 
trying to get money to make him. But it doesn't stop there with Faust. The next day at Faust, Don Diego Adams, remember Don Diego Adams? He goes to Ziedman with a television because the television was taken, a Vizio television was taken from Mr. Rooster's house and it was pawned the very next day for $150. Mr. Rooster's television was pawned the very next day for $150. The day after, the day after, Mr. Rooster was robbed with a gun with a laser pointer. He's very distinctive about that. These photographs appear on the defendant's phone with a laser pointer. These photographs of the defendant holding a gun, the laser pointer, just like the one that was used to rob Mr. Rooster. The next robbery I want to talk to you about is a robbery of Miss Crosley that takes place on LaSalle Street. Now, Miss Crosley is an 88-year-old woman. She's coming home from a sorority meeting, and she's accosted in the driveway in February. And she's taken inside and she's robbed. She's forced to lie on the ground and she's robbed of her belongings. She can't identify anyone because they're wearing masks. But Mr. Williams is going to tell us that's part of this conspiracy. That's a robbery that he and Mr. Smith was involved in. The next robbery I want to tell you about is the robbery of a 78-year-old man who was a cancer survivor. And he was coming home from hanging out with his friends at a bar. Um, he goes in his driveway. Someone walks up to him wearing a mask and a gun and says, don't do anything stupid or I'm going to kill you. And Mr. Williams is going to tell us that that's them. That's part of this conspiracy. That they go in and they rob him. They rob him of his, of his coins, his cash, jewelry, and his cameras. The next robbery I want to tell you about takes place on Asbury Park. And this is a robbery of two individuals sitting in a car, uh, a man and a woman. And they're sitting in a car just spending the evening together. They've been boyfriend and girlfriend for a number of years. And the defendant and his co-defendant, Mr. Williams, walk up on them to rob them. They walk up to rob them. And the, and the female takes off running. The defendant runs up after the female, grabs her, hits her in the head with a pistol, takes her purse, takes her back to the car. The co-defendant grabs the driver, takes him out, takes his property. They take the car. A beautiful saber. Come in a carjacking at that point. Mr. Williams is going to tell us that's him and the defendant. Next one I want to tell you about is on Eileen Street. And this is a situation where a husband and wife are home. Mr. Bryant is working in his house. He's cleaning up. He's taking some recyclables outside. And he's accosted in his own street. And he's taken back into the house. He's forced to lie on the ground at gunpoint while people are taking the Masonic ring off his finger. People are taking jewelry off him. Another co-defendant goes upstairs. And the wife, Miss Session, is in the bathroom. They burst in the bathroom and she says, Do you want to die today? Then give me your stuff takes the ring off her finger. They can't get the ring off her finger. They have to use soap and water as if they're in a finger. finger. Snatching jewelry off her neck. They point a gun at their son, who's a special needs child, and threaten this special needs child just to get the property that they can get so that they can make money by robbing people. The next robbery takes place is an attempted robbery on Ward Street. And this is the defendant, and this is Mr. Williams again. And this is an individual that I told you about that didn't comply, just like Judge Burke, didn't comply with the demands of the defendant. And he was shot. And he was shot in the back of the head as he's driving away. Nine staples to the back of his head to close the injury inflicted by the defendant and by Mr. Williams during the course of that robbery. Now, one of the things the judge is going to tell you is that you have to judge credibility, who you believe and what you believe and how you believe, whether you believe a witness. And I'm telling you a lot of information about a lot of crimes that were committed during the course of this conspiracy. And I told you during jury selection, I'm telling you now, that we have a co-defendant, Mr. Williams and Mr. Adams, who are going to testify. And part of your job is to decide whether you believe them or not. Whether you believe what they said in light of the evidence. And the judge is going to tell you how does the testimony of the witnesses fit with the other evidence. I'm going to tell you right now, this ward shooting, the police knew nothing about this. This was not on their radar as it relates to this case or this defendant. Until Mr. Williams said, I need to tell you something. During the course of his debriefing with the police, he said, we shot a guy, I think it's on Ward Street, it was in a Durango or truck, and I think I killed him. But I shot him. And the guns that were used were guns that we've used before. And there's 40 caliber casings and there's 9 millimeter casings at the scene of that Ward Street shooting. And he says, the 40 caliber gun belongs to Mr. Smith. And the 9 millimeter gun is a gun I borrowed from Don Diego Adams. And that should be there. So when they tested the gun they found, when they the search warrant to the defendant's house, that 40 caliber with the laser pointer, it matched those bullets on Ward Street. 
they tested Don Diego Adams' gun, the 9mm that he was caught with, that matched the 9mm casings on that crime scene that Mr. Williams had that night. Now, we didn't know anything about that until Mr. Williams told us about that. So Mr. Williams came forward and said, this is a case that I was involved in. So when you're thinking about credibility, think about how the other evidence fits with the testimony of the witnesses. Think about how that evidence fits when you're deciding credibility. Look at the photos of the damage to the car that was caused by the defendant and Mr. Williams on Ward Street. This is the victim's car. There's a gunshot wounds all over the car. It was a family dollar robbery that took place in January. Part of this conspiracy to rob businesses as well. I told you it wasn't limited to people in the homes. It wasn't limited to people in the cars. It also applied to businesses. Again, this is a situation where Mr. Williams told us about the nature of this robbery as part of the conspiracy. You're going to hear evidence about this case, about how Mr. Smith fired a gun during the course of that robbery as well. The last robbery takes place in a different jurisdiction. It takes place at May 20th, <coughs> 2015. This is a robbery of a jewelry store that the defendant and all four other co-conspirators were involved in. Again, this is a case we didn't know anything about until Mr. Williams told us we robbed a jewelry store. And that was my idea. That's what I'm just going to say. It was my idea. I was tired of these little, little takes. I wanted a big take. I wanted to get thousands of dollars, not hundreds of dollars. So they conspired together and decided to rob a jewelry store or a business. And they went here and committed this robbery as part of the conspiracy. Didn't know anything about this case until Mr. Williams, during his debriefing, in exchange for his plea agreement, told us about it. So he told us that he, Mr. Russell, Mr. Smith, Mr. Adams, and Alan Corbin were involved in this robbery. And he says, the only two people who went in to the store were the defendant and Mr. Corbin. They go inside the store to commit the robbery. And on the video, you're going to see the defendant walking in the store, having a conversation with the, with the, um, the employees of the store. You're going to see him with a gun. He pulls out a gun. He waves it around after pretending to be a customer. He jumps over a counter. When he jumps over the counter, he puts his hand on the glass counter. His hand on the glass counter. Now that's a fatal mistake because his palm print is on that counter. The defendant's palm print is on that counter. <coughs> Along with the photographs of him coming this robbery, his palm print is on that counter. He cuts his leg from broken glass when he's breaking the glass. He pistol whips the, the employees of that store because they're not complying with him. He pistol whips an employee because he pushes the panic button. They take jewelry and they leave. They leave. The next day they go to a pawn shop. And they pawn that jewelry at one of the pawn shops they go to. And you're going to hear testimony from Don Diego Adams out how he was involved with Alan Corbin to go and commit these uh, pawn shops. How they would take the money that they got from the robberies and go to the pawn shops. That's the last robbery they committed during the course of the conspiracy. But there's other evidence you're going to hear. You're going to hear about the search warrant of the defendant's house. And I mentioned to you that a gun was found there. Well, not only was a gun found there, but the hat that he was wearing in the robbery at the jewelry store, the gun with the laser pointer, ammunition that's found there, other items that you're going to hear about that were part of this conspiracy that were used. I talked to you a little bit about witness credibility. I'm not going to talk about that again. But it's for your job to decide whether we proved our case beyond a reasonable doubt. And one of the ways you're going to do that is to decide the credibility. Now, I know you're going to hear testimony from two of the co-conspirators. You're going to hear that they pled guilty. One to a home invasion count, one to an armed robbery account, in exchange for a reduced sentence. But part of that, their agreement is they have to tell, tell the truth. And if they don't, they lose their deal. And they're going to testify. And they're going to tell you what they did. Mr. Williams is going to tell you what they did, Nunu. And you're going to hear from Don Diego Adams as well. And they're going to tell you what they did. Keep in mind when you hear that testimony, keep in mind that these are guys that were robbing people. These are guys that were just as culpable as the defendant, but they choose to come forward and tell us about things. We would not have known about the ward shooting. We would not have known about the jewelry store robbery, but for Mr. Williams telling us that. So when you're judging credibility, keep an open mind and listen to those testimonies when you decide whether you believe the testimony of those witnesses. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of cases. It's a lot of evidence. Um, the way the trial works is I'm going to call witnesses, and then I rest. The defense can call witnesses if they wish, and then we get a chance to talk to you about it in closing arguments. Opening statements is not the chance <coughs> to tell you why we think the defendant is guilty. It's to tell you why I think the evidence is going to show. And I've shown you that the evidence is going to show that on March 5th of 2015, the defendant shot Judge Burke because he was trying to rob Judge Burke in the course of that robbery. You're going to hear testimony from the co-defendant, Mr. Williams. And Mr. Williams is going to tell you at first 
He didn't say that he was involved in that robbery. He didn't say he was in the car. And he came forward and said, you know, i got to be honest. I, I was the guy standing alone. I was the guy standing next to Mr. Smith. But Mr. Smith was the one that was talking about. Mr. Adams is going to tell you he's the driver of the car. First story he tells the police, I wasn't there, man. I know nothing about it. It was my, it was someone else's car. I wasn't there. And he says, you know what? I was the driver. I just didn't want to be involved in that particular case. Because I didn't want to be involved in the shooting of the judge. He told the police that. So when you can assess their credibility, it's your job to decide what you believe. The simple fact, ladies and gentlemen, is that the defendant is charged with conspiracy to commit armed robberies, assault, with intent to commit murder, armed robbery, and weapons charges. You're going to hear all this testimony from all the victims. You're going to see the physical evidence. You're going to hear the words of the defendant. You're going to hear the 911 calls. You're going to hear about the nature of that conspiracy. And when all that is said and done, you will be convinced, beyond a reasonable doubt, that the defendant is guilty <coughs> of the charges we stated. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Mr. McWilliams. Yes, Your Honor. Your Honor, um, thank you, Mr. Congressman. Your Honor, I announce to the court that in view of the number of um, witnesses and the number of uh, exhibits that will be presented uh, allegedly by the prosecution, that the defendant, Mr. Smith, announces to the court at this time that we will reserve our opening statement until it's our side of the case to present. All right, thank you, Mr. McWilliams. Thank Ladies you. Ladies and gentlemen, I need you to step into the jury room for just about 60 seconds. All right, Mr. Jerry. Gentlemen in the blue and the green T-shirt, where are you with, please? In the Detroit News, sir. Um, I thought I had made it clear. Perhaps you didn't understand me, but I said silent shutter. I can hear your camera clicking every time you take a photograph, and that is distracting to the jury. We can't have that. Other, I mean, we've been doing this for years, and I am very welcoming of media who come in and cover cases. In fact, even though the administrative order says that it's only supposed to usually be two uh, cameras uh, in, in, in the courtroom, I've allowed three. And I am very welcoming. But the administrative order from the Michigan Supreme Court, Administrative Order 1989-1, specifically says under subsection 5B, only still camera equipment, which does not produce distracting sound or light, shall be employed in covering judicial proceedings. It, I can hear it from here, and I can't have that, because then the jury is going to be emphasizing or looking to what you think is important, because it's clicking. So, unless you've got a silent shutter, you can't take still photographs. All right? Bring out the jury. Yes, please take your seats. Maybe see that. All right. Mr. Brand, do you have a witness you'd like to call, please? Yes, sir. Thank you. Raise your right hand for me. 
you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Sounds like God. Please have a seat, if you would, and adjust the microphone in front of you. May I inquire the witness, Your Honor? Please, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Uh, tell me your name, please. Tamar Jeffrey. Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, are you employed? Yes. What do you do? I'm an emergency medicine physician. You're, you're a licensed doctor in the state of Michigan? Yes. Dr. Jeffries, how long have you been a doctor in the state of Michigan? Um, since 2009, completion of gra uh, residency. Okay. Um, back on March 5th of 2015, um, were you anywhere near 18905 Oak Drive Street in the city of Detroit sometime around 915 that evening? Uh, yes, sir. And uh, at that time, uh, were you living in that area? Yes. Okay. And without giving us your address, which street were you living on back on March of last year? Oak Drive. Did you know the occupants of 18905 Oak Drive? Yes. And how was it you know them? Uh, they're my neighbors, and I purchased the home that I live in from them. Okay, you bought the house you're living in from them? Yes. Okay. Um, that evening, um, did something unusual happen around 9.15? Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the time frame, but I had actually a little before that had just unloaded groceries, walked into the home, um, was in my house, and received a phone call from one of my neighbors. And without telling us what that person said, did you do anything in response to the phone call you received from one of your neighbors? Yes. What did you do, Dr. Jeffers? Um, I ran outside. You, le you left your home? Yes. You went outside your home? Yes. Where did you go? I went directly uh, to my neighbor's home. Okay, which home was that? Uh, at the end of the block. I can't remember their address, okay. but... Do you know who they are? Yes. Who are they? Uh, the Birch, the Anita, Birch. and Terrence. Anita and uh, Terrence Birch? Yes. So, um, did you take anything with you when you went across the street, or, I'm sorry, left your house and went to the Birch house? No. Okay. Um, when you got... Strike that. As you're walking to, uh, to the Birch house, what do you see? Uh... Really just had tunnel vision. Uh, ran directly, saw people on the porch, ran to the porch. Uh, his wife was there. He was there on the porch laid out in another neighbor. So when you arrived at their address, the Berg's house, yes. his wife was outside? Yes. And uh, what was Terrence Berg doing? He was laid out on the porch. Okay, lying on the porch? Yes. Okay. And another neighbor was in the uh, on the porch as well? Yes. Okay. Describe the scene please. Uh, let's see, his wife was saying he'd been shot. Um, you know, he was cold. I went over to assess real quick, um, asked for a blanket because he was cold. Yeah. What happened next? Um, also asked for some scissors to cut his pants because, I, like I said, I don't, I would just receive the phone call. I didn't know what happened. How many shots might have been fired? Nothing. So just to assess where I knew he was hurting at. Okay. So you need to assess the situation? Yes. And did you get scissors? Uh, someone out of the house got scissors. And what did you do with him? I cut his pants. Okay, and did you examine him as he's lying on the porch? A uh, quick exam, yes. Okay. Just I mean, you're an emergency room doctor, so you're sort of used to the trauma situation? Yes. Okay. So you knew right away you had to find out what the injury was, for lack of a better term? Yes, I like, did a facial scan of him just from head to toe. I mean, he was bundled up and then went directly to where he was complaining of pain. And what did you observe? A uh, single, like, pen penetrating wound to the knee. Had you ever seen a, an injury like that before as an emergency room doctor? Yes. Oh. So it's not out of your experience to see a gunshot wound to a, a human body? No. Okay. What did you do? Uh, after that, uh, look, there was nothing to hold pressure on at that time. DPD had arrived, so... It was just so the Detroit police had arrived. What happened once the Detroit police arrived? Uh, once they arrived, we were waiting for EMS. Did they arrive? No. What, what happened? Uh, I'm not sure what happened with them. Um, while we were sitting there, someone asked if he was stable, and I was like, yes, and they transported him via police car to the hospital. Were you present when they put him in the car and drove to the hospital? Yes. Doctor, what did you do after that? I followed the police car to the hospital. Why did you do that? Uh, that's just what I do. That's just me. Okay. Right. So you went to the hospital? Yes. What happened once you got there? Uh, once I arrived at the hospital, um, I informed them who, what was going on because his wife was in another vehicle uh, trailing. Um, and I asked for permission just to go into the trauma bay. Now, is that a facility that you work at? No. Oh. So did you, did you receive permission to go into the trauma bay with the doctors treating him? Uh, yes, afterwards, yes. Okay, and, you, and you went inside? Yes. Okay, so you were present while the other doctors and nurses 
and staff were working on Terrence Burke? Well, not while they were working on him, while they were, uh, for someone that's never been to an emergency room, especially as what they would consider a trauma code, that could be overwhelming. So knowing this person personally, I just wanted to peek in there and let him know what was about to happen to him. So, so if I understand your testimony, Doctor, you're there to try to comfort Mr. Berg, not help out with the Oh, no, okay. no. And did you do that? Yes. And then uh, at some point in time, did his wife arrive at the hospital? Yes, she was in the family room. Yes. And did you meet with, sit with her or meet with her? Yes, after I let him know what was going on and kind of assessed and make sure that was the only wound there, because that's all I was able to see, uh, left and I sat with his wife. So you didn't actually um, perform any procedure with Terrence Bird? No. Okay, very good. It was just a civilian. That's it. Okay, very good. That's all I have now. Mr. McWilliams. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Uh, you've been a doctor for several years now? Yes. Okay. And although you don't work at the facility, which would have been uh, uh, Sinai Hospital, Sinai Grace, uh, you're familiar with uh, emergency rooms, are you not? Yes. Okay. Uh, you recall that this happened back on um, March the 5th, 2015? Yes. That's some over a year ago, maybe 14 months ago. Yes. And I take it it's still vivid in your mind. Yes. Do you remember what the, what the date and weather and ground was like uh, on the 5th of uh, March 2015? Uh, yes, I, yes, I do. Well, what was it, please? Uh, it was one of those cold days, and I know that was one of the days where it kind of warmed up a little and everything had iced over. Okay. So. Was there snow on the ground? Uh, yes, but it was, like, frozen, like okay. how it's, you know, Hard turned. crust? Yes. Okay. But there was inches of snow on the ground, if you recall? Yes. Okay, hard crust. Had you just arrived home um, shortly before um, you, you know, responded to this alarm? Yes. Okay. And had you come from somewhere? Yes. W w did I sense that you had been out shopping? Yes, I okay. come from Meyer up the street. Okay. How long had you been home before you received this alarm? Probably maybe 10 to 15 minutes okay. that I had been at home. Thank you. And um, you live immediately across the street from the Bergs? No. Kitty Corner from the Bergs? Yes, about three house, houses, would, Kitty would Corner. Would it seem likely that um, if there had been any cars in the street, you would have seen any cars in the street before uh, entering, I presume, your driveway and your home? If there were cars on the Oak Drive, I would have saw them, like any cars that I wouldn't have recognized. Okay, in the drive, but I'm speaking really now in the street. In the, in the actual street? Yes, ma'am. No, I didn't see any in the street. Okay, you didn't see any in the street? No. Okay. Um, are you on the corner? No. Okay. Did you have to come around the corner of Judge Berg's home? No. Okay. So it was a car on the other side of, of uh, the corner where Judge Berg uh, lives and his house you might not have seen a car around there. Is that what you're saying? I would not be able to see a car around there from where I live. Okay, thank you. Well, would you have seen it on your on your drive home? No, because I did not come that way to get home. Okay. Because you're referring to Clarita. I wouldn't come that way from coming from Meyer. Okay, thank you. Um, at a point in time that this would have likely have happened, did you hear anything out of the ordinary, um, such as uh, possibly detecting a gunshot? No. Okay, you didn't hear anything? No. Is your Were you in your kitchen when you were unloading your groceries? No, I, was up, I never even unloaded my groceries as far as putting them up. They were on the floor. That's how this happened. Okay. I was in the upstairs back of my house. Okay, but you were, you came from your car and you were inside your home. Yes. And I take it that the kitchen is not right on the edge of the outside, but somewhat deeper into the home? Yes. And is that what you attribute not being able to... to possibly have heard the shot. No, like I said, when I received a phone call, I was upstairs in the back of my home running bath water, so I wouldn't, it's winter time, it's big old brick homes, you don't hear anything if your windows are closed unless you're right at a window. All right. Do, did you receive a phone call? Yes. Okay. What, did it come from the Berg's home or from another neighbor or, or what? Came from another neighbor. All right. And that was essentially the alarm which set you into action, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Um, when you went across the street, did you know that the person allegedly uh, had been shot with a gun or anything like that? 
Uh, yes, that was my neighbor's phone call was someone crying and saying our neighbor has been shot. Okay, presumably the wife of Judge Burke. Uh, no. Oh, this it was, was another, another neighbor. neighbor. Yes. It was another neighbor crying. Yes. Okay. Did it sound like or appear to you that that neighbor was, in fact, across the street on the scene? No, they weren't. Okay. All right. Well, on your home, do you have uh, uh, any special extra lighting or any extra special um, security measures or anything like that on your home? Yes. Okay. And because of what was happening across the street, did any of that come on or was it in fact on? Uh, no, I have landscape lighting and lights that just come up that are motion censored. Okay. Had they, did you have occasion to notice whether or not they'd come on? Mm, no. Okay. Did you have any occasion to look out or to notice anybody running down the sidewalk or running to a car or running it all away from the scene? No, because that wasn't my mindset. Like I said, to people, I went into straight doctor mode, concern mode, had tunnel vision, and went directly to where I see, saw my neighbors. You were making a beeline over there? Yeah. Okay, when you got there, you saw someone on the porch, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and did you recognize right away who it was? Yes. Okay, and did you recognize his spouse? Yes. And did you recognize the, the terror of the situation? Mm. Um, what exactly pan- do you the mean? The panic of the situation. For them, yes. Yes, okay. And uh, did you give any orders or instructions medically at that time? Yes. What were they? Uh, to get a blanket because it's cold. Yes. Um, also, someone had already put a belt around the leg. Okay, and what and purpose would that have served? If someone was bleeding out, that would be to stop a hemorrhage, you know, to control the bleeding. Did you see that to be either a likelihood or, in fact, happening? Uh, no. Okay. Um, although that we may have been have seen a demonstration during opening statement of the pointing of the left knee of the victim, what knee did you actually find that the gunshot wound was to? I believe if, it was the right. Right knee. Is that correct? I believe so. All right. <clears throat> How much time did you spend there before Judge Berg uh, was um, transported by police car? Honestly, I wasn't keeping track of time. Okay. Could it have been more than 10 minutes? Not sure. Wouldn't be able to comment. You never saw EMS arrive, did you? No. Okay. And he went to the hospital in the back of a scout car? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Moran? No questions. (coughs) Any questions by the jurors? Doctor, thank thank you. You can step up. Thank you. Yes. Could you give the my court reporter your full name, please? Mm-hmm. You saw me swear the testimony you're about to give. Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, self you got. I do. All right, please have a seat. Just the microphone in front of you. Mm-hmm. May I inquire, Your Honor? Please. Tell me your name, please. My name is Patricia Montemurray. Ms. Montemurray, just for the record, can I have your age, please? I'm 58. And um, back in March of 2005, I'm oh, sorry, March 5th, 2015, um, were you working at that time? Yes, I was. What type of work were you doing at that time? Um, I was a reporter for the Detroit Free Press. Back in March of 2015, specifically March 5th of 2015, um, that evening, did you have occasion to be anywhere near 18905 Oak Drive Street in the city of Detroit? Yes, I did. And why were you at that location? I was visiting the Sevier Berg family, and I was giving um, public speaking tips to their son uh, to their son in advance of a speech tournament he was competing in. And um, did you know the Sevier Berg family prior to that evening? Yes, I did. Friends of yours. Yes, they are. And you were over helping their son with his speech. That is correct. And what's the name of his, of, of their son? 
uh, Teddy Berg. And how was his approximate age? He was a junior um, at that time, and I'd say he was 16 or 17. I'm not sure. What kind of speech was he giving? He was giving a, um, an original oratory address to compete in a Detroit Catholic Forensics League tournament, and I, um, I don't recall what his speech was about at the time. <laughs> um, so the Sevier Bergs asked you to come over and work with Teddy uh, on the speech. I did, yes. You did? Okay, you yeah. volunteered. Uh -huh. So you go over the evening. About what time was it when you arrived that evening? If you're um, I probably arrived around 6:30. I uh, probably around 7. Okay. And had you been to that home before? Yes, I had. Okay. Nothing unusual about going over to that house. No. And while you were there, did you have dinner with the brothers? Yes, I did. And did um, the the son participate in the dinner as well? Um, I believe he did. Okay. And um, at some point during this dinner or that in the evening, you worked <coughs> with Teddy. I did. On the speech, correct? Yes, I did. About what time was it, uh, Ms. Montemore, when you left that evening? Um, it was after nine, maybe nine ten, nine fifteen. And um, <coughs> were you by yourself going to the house and leaving the house? Uh, well, going into the house, I was by myself. When I left the house, I was escorted by uh, Terry Berg. Okay, I'll get that in a second. Mm -hmm. um, so no one else went with you to the house, and no one else <laughs> uh, accompanied you to the house and left with you. That is correct. And did you drive yourself to the house? Yes, I did. What type of vehicle were you driving back then? Um, I, uh, it's a 2008 uh, Dodge Caravan van. Uh, uh, that's one of those minivans, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, did you park the minivan somewhere in the vicinity of the Burr House? Yes, I did. Do you remember which street you were on? I parked on the side street, Clarita. Clarita, okay. And um, had you ever parked there on that street before that evening? Yes, I had. Okay. So you walked yourself in when you got there sometime around 6? When you're leaving sometime after 9, uh, Judge Berg walks out with you. Yes, he did. Okay. Does anyone else go with you besides uh, Terry Berg? No. Okay. And you leave the house, and did you go directly to your car? Yes, we did. And did, the, did uh, Terry Berg walk with you to your car? Yes, he did. Okay. I assume you're just having small talk, pleasantries, that sort of thing? That is correct. Anything unusual between the front door of the house? I'm sorry. <coughs> did you leave the front door of the house? Yes, we did. Anything unusual occur between leaving the front door of the house and going to your car in Clarita, Clarita Street? No, nothing. And the, the Berg House, if I understand it, is at the intersection of Clarita and Oak Drive, is that right? That is correct. In fact, they have the corner house. That is correct. So, uh, the judge walks you to your car, you get into your car? Yes, I did. And you drive away? Yes, I did. Anything unusual happen um, as you're driving away? Um, nothing unusual happened while I was driving away. I waved to the judge as he was bringing in the garbage cans, and then I turned, uh, I turned south at the intersection to head home. Okay. Uh, so the last you see that I, Judge Berg is taking his garbage cans in. Yes. And you wave to him, and you turn south, you go home. Yes. Okay. And do you go straight home? Yes, I did. Um, at some point in time after going home, do you hear something um, unusual happen to Judge Berg that evening? Um, I I heard what happened when I, I when I got home, I um. I called Anita, uh, Judge Berg's wife, up to tell her about something else that occurred to me. And when I called her on her cell phone, she informed me that the judge had been shot. And about what time was that, Ms. Um, if you were That was probably like quarter to 10, uh, 9.45 or so. So you called Ms. Sevier just to tell her something you, that occurred to you to tell her about <laughs> what you were doing with Teddy. Right. And that's when she told you that the judge had been shot. That is correct. Now, as you're walking to your car with the judge and as you're leaving, waving goodbye, did you see anything unusual outside the house? Um, I didn't see anything unusual. The only thing um, I remember noticing was that uh, there was a car parked on, uh, on Oak Drive that was very close to the stop sign. And uh, I just thought, oh, that car wasn't there before. It's really close to the stop sign. And did you notice were there any occupants of the car? No. I no. Okay, I just saw a car. That is correct. Parked on Oak Drive. I thought that wasn't there when I came. Yes. Did you see anyone approach um, uh, Judge Berg as he's taking the trash cans before that? <coughs> no, I didn't. Did you hear any shots out of fire? No, I didn't. In fact, so you didn't know that Judge Berg had been shot after you got home and heard it from Ms. Sevier? That is correct. Okay. That's all I have, Ms. Montemore, you're on. Thank you. Mr. McWilliams? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Hello. Uh, you were working for newspaper at the time? Uh, yes, I was. Okay, and in what capacity? I'm a re I was a reporter, a journalist. Okay, thank you very much. 
And you'd been to the Berg house before? Yes, I have. And where had you usually parked? I take it they probably have a driveway to a garage? Uh, yes, I usually parked on the street. Okay. Any particular reason? Uh, well, their driveway is very, very short, and parking's easier on the street. Okay. Um, when you got there, was um, both uh, adult parents there besides uh, the, the young man, Teddy? Yes, they were. Okay. And you spent a good, some portion of the evening there, did you not? In yes, including I did. Including dinner? Yes. Was there any adult beverages drank uh, or presented or offered uh, mm -hmm. during the time you were there? No. Consumed? Not that I recall. Any consumed that you can recall? No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, do you see a gentleman seated here at the uh, defense table in a black suit, a uh, white shirt, black tie? Do you recognize that gentleman? No, I don't. You've never seen him before, have you? I've never seen him before. Thank you very much. Now, um, having um, you, you had your minivan, correct? Yes. And um, when um, you were there, did you uh, have occasion to appear or peep, peep out the window to see anything that was going on or might have been going on in the street? No, I didn't. Okay. And uh, at some point in time in the evening, it was time for you to depart to go home. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And um, I take it that Judge Berg walked you out to your vehicle? Yes, he did. Okay. Was that for the purpose, in your opinion, of security or for as a courtesy? Um, I believe it was both, and it, the the, um, the the sidewalks were icy, and the um, area was snow covered, and um, he I believe it was a combination of both. Okay, and the courtesy was with regard to possible slip and fall. Yes. And the security was it was dark out, was it not? Um, it was nighttime. Yes. Okay, and did, did you notice or do you recall uh, whether or not there were lights out? Uh, um, either street lights uh, for the neighborhood or lights that came on or, or were on uh, as a result of Judge Berg's home? Um, I, I remember the front porch light was on, um, on the Berg house. Did you go in and out, uh, coming and going from the front door? Yes, I did. Okay. And then you walked down the sidewalk, to, uh, down the, the, the walkway to the sidewalk, correct? I believe, yeah, uh, yes. And there was probably snow, crusted snow on the ground, and you, you didn't want to walk on that. That is correct. You went out to the sidewalk. Yes. Which way did you turn, left or right? Uh, we turned uh, right, headed south. Okay. And um, did you notice um, any vehicle at that particular time uh, at the stop sign? I didn't notice the vehicle until I was in my car. Okay. And that, and that is the other vehicle that you said that you, you said at the stop sign. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Okay. And you saw no one, or re remember saw, seeing no one, or you detected no one in that car. Is that correct? Uh, I don't remember anybody being in that car. Okay. Thank you. Um, had you ever been uh, escorted out to your vehicle, having visited the Bergs before? I don't recall. Okay. Did you ever feel insecure by uh, going out in the evening from the house to your car being unescorted? No, I didn't. Okay. Had you been unescorted out to the, your car um, in, the, in an evening dark time? Probably. Okay. Yes. Did you have any personal reason to be or feel insecure? No, sir. Okay. Do you know whether or not... Um, looking back at the door that you had exited to see whether or not Mrs. Berg was standing at the door to watch you go to the to your minivan. I don't recall. Would it have been unusual or usual, if, if you can tell us, for one of the Bergs to stand and watch you uh, if, if you hadn't been uh, escorted to, be es to go alone out to your vehicle? Could you repeat that yes, again, please? I'm sorry, it was a little bit convoluted. And going out to the your your vehicle, either on that night or on other nights, I should say, would it have been usual for one of the adult Mr. and Mrs. Berg 
to stand at the door to watch you get safely to your vehicle? I don't think it would be unusual, but I don't recall it. Okay. They could have. Important. They might have. I, I, I don't know. Okay. Were you aware of any special duty or relationship that Mrs. Berg or any of the Bergs had with regard to their position in the neighborhood over there? <coughs> no, I don't. Okay. You were escorted out to your vehicle, got in it, left and uh, had an afterthought about something, you called Mrs. Berg and found out what was going on. Is that it? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Mr. Moran? I have another question. Any questions by the jurors? Ms. Montemore, thank you. You may be excused. Thank you. Next witness. Solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give it will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help you guys. I do. Please have a seat. Just the microphone. I inquire the witness, Ron. Whenever you're ready. Thank you. Tell me your name, sir. My name is Terrence Berg. Mr. Berg, are you um, employed? Yes, I am. What do you do? I'm a U.S. District Judge. Um, judge Berg, how long have you been a U.S. District Judge? I've been a U.S. District Judge for three and a half years. And what is the jurisdiction of your court? It's the Eastern District of Michigan, and so if you take the Lower Peninsula, basically it's the eastern half of the Lower Peninsula. And uh, you indicated that you have been a District Judge for three and a half years. Prior to that, what, what did you do? I was an Assistant U.S. Attorney for most of my career. Uh, from 1989 until 1999, and then I worked for the Michigan Attorney General for four years uh, until 2003. I came back to the U.S. Attorney's Office from 2003 until 2012, the end of 2012, and then I started as a judge in January 2013. Um, I'm going to take you back, if I can, to March 5th of last year, 2015. Um, in that <coughs> evening, sir, were you anywhere near 18905 Oak Drive Street in the city of Detroit? Uh, yes, I was. That's yeah. my home. That's your home. And how long has that been your home? Uh, we have lived in that house since 1989. When you say we, what do you mean? Uh, my family, my wife, Anita Sevier, and our three children. And um, back in March of 2015, were all three children living with you at the home um, that, at that time? No, only our son, our youngest. And your two older children, um, were they somewhere else? Yes. Uh, my eldest daughter was at that time working in New York. She had a job. She was out of college. And my second eldest daughter was in college in New York. And your son, um, what's his name? Teddy. Teddy. Uh, was he still in high school? He was. Okay. He is. He's graduating this year. Oh, congratulations. Um, so it's you, your wife, Lita Sevier, and your son, Teddy, at the home back in March 2015 on a regular basis? Yes, we were. Okay. On the day of March 15th, uh, March 5th, 2015, um, did you have a, a guest over that evening? We did. Uh, we had Patty Montemori over, who is a friend from church, and she was helping my son with his forensics speech that he had prepared. Okay. And um, did she also partake in a family meal with you? Yes, we had dinner, and then she was helping him to practice. So she's working with your son on his speech. Fair enough? That's right. Okay. Anything else unusual going on that evening at that house? No, it was a relatively normal night. Okay. Typical Thursday night at the Burr Sevier house. That's right. Okay. At some point in time, does Ms. Montemori um, decide to leave your house? Yes, she had finished uh, helping my son, and... Uh, uh, she was leaving, and then I walked her to her car. 
Um, Judge Berg, at approximately what time was it that Ms. Montemori uh, left your home that evening? It was right around 9 o'clock or so. Okay. And um, did you leave the house, go outside to walk uh, Ms. Montemori to your car? I did. Uh, it was March. It was very cold. There was a lot of snow on the ground and ice. And uh, I think I had slipped earlier that day, actually. And uh, so I walked her to her vehicle. We're on a corner house. And uh, her car was parked uh, uh, on the, uh, let's see, this, the, the street that's on the north side of our house. Sorry, the south side of our house, which is Clarita. So she was parked on Clarita. The house is on Clarita and Oak Drive. And she parked over here on Clarita. And so I walked her to her car. May I approach the witness, Ron? Yes. Um, Judge Berger, I'm handing you what's remarked as People's Proposed Exhibits 1 and 2, which are maps. I ask you to take a look at those if you would. Okay. Yes. Uh, do those uh, maps, People's Proposed, number 1 and number 2, um, reflect the area in which your house is situated back on March 15th, of, March 5th of 2015? They do. Okay. And that, does it depict the streets Oak Street and Clarita Street as it relates to your house? Uh, yes, it's Oak Drive actually. Oak Drive, I'm well. Yes, okay. and uh, you can see both. You can see the intersection there, right here. There's. So here's Clarita, and here's here's Oak Drive here, and there's our house. And Patty was parked here on Clarita, where I'm pointing. Thank you. Who to propose one and two, Your Honor? Any objections? No, Your Honor. That's one and two. One and two. Um, can you bring those up? They'll be uh, one and two will be received. Number eight. Two. Um, Judge, where you're, where you're sitting there, can you see the screen? Yes, I can. Okay. And if this is Oak Drive, and this is Clarita Avenue, is that correct? Um, yes, uh, that's Clarita, although let me just uh, get a little oriented here about, uh, because, okay, that's Livernois. Yes, you. that's right. That's oriented correctly, and uh, that star is right where our house is. So this uh, the star is situated at 18905 Oak Drive. That's okay. correct. Okay. And this would be Oak Drive running north and south? Yes, it is. And clear running east and west, is that correct? That's exactly right. Okay. And you were describing for the jury uh, the location of Ms. Montemori's uh, minivan that was parked on the street, is that correct? Yes. So her, her, her which car street? was on Clarita, which you can see is the street that's running east and west there. And it's just to the south of our house. So the car was south of your house uh, on Clarita, but it was also east of, Oak, I'm sorry, west of Oak Drive. Yes. Okay. All right. So as you're leaving your house, did you leave the front door, side door, back door? I went right out the front door. And is there a sidewalk or a walkway that leads from your front porch to uh, Oak Drive? Yes. There's a walkway that goes from our front porch down to the sidewalk. And did you use that to walk uh, Ms. Montemoy to her car on Oak Drive? Yes, I did. Okay. And you indicated that that night there was snow and ice and it was cold outside? It was very cold and there was snow and ice. So I'm going to hand you what's been marked um, a number of exhibits. Proposed exhibits number three, four, that's hence, three through. 23 and 509. Ask you to take a look at those, if you would. Just review them. All right, I've reviewed them. And 
First of all, they are photographs, is that correct? Yes, they're all photographs. And with the exception of... Not every single one, but um, in general, um, Judge, um, with all the exhibits I showed you, with the exception of 509 and People's Exhibit Number Three, uh, there are photographs that depict the scene uh, around the vicinity of your house that evening on March 5, 2015. Is that correct? Yes. Most of the photographs appeared to be from the same time, if not the exact same night, because the w the weather looked the same and the snow looked the same. A couple of the photos were more recent photos that were not in the same season. People's exhibit number three and people's proposed exhibit number 509, correct? That's right. With the exception of these two, the balance of the photographs uh, appear to be from the vicinity of your home that evening, correct? They did. Uh, I've my motion, Your Honor. Any objection? No objection. <coughs> three through uh, 23 and 509 will be received. For the exhibits, I'm going to hand you what's been marked as people's proposed exhibit number. 37. What was that number again? I'm sorry. 337. Okay. Judge Ford, do you recognize that? I recognize this as a uh, drawing or depiction of the uh, uh, view of our house and the walkway from the sidewalk to our house, uh, looking at it from above. It's a, it's a hand drawing. It appears to be a, a sketch of the layout of the front of your house, um, the walkway, the porch, the side street, uh, Clarita, and um, Oak Drive. Is that correct? Yes. And it's a view, as you said, from above. If someone were hovering above the tree that's in your front yard and looking down, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Move to admit your office for the 337. Without objection. You'll be received. Your Honor, this photograph, this drawing is extremely light and would not would wash out on, on the projector. Uh, I have prepared 14 copies for the jury which I've attended to the court. That's fine. I would have no objection. We'll Maybe publish it. I <coughs> have my uh, deputy pass to that. Actually, 15. I'll be one of you, too. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Judge Burke. Um, we're going through the um, the path you took that evening. Can I have exhibit number three, please? There's people exhibit number three. Um, Judge, this is your house on Oak Drive, is that correct? Yes. And um, this is Oak Drive here, directly in front of the house by the trash cans, correct? That's right. That's Oak Drive where you're pointing. And Clarita is the side street, correct? That's right. Okay. Now, um, as we look at people's exhibit number three, you indicated to us that uh, you and Miss Montemori left the front of your home that night out the front door, is that correct? Yes, I did. I walked right out. You can see the front door there next to the tree. I walked out, walked down the little walkway there. Um, I turned right, which is left on the picture, and crossed into Clarita, which you can see there's Clarita, the side street, and walked over to her car, which was right around, if you can see that bush that's on the corner, and just a little to the right of the bush over at that other curb was where the uh, car was parked. 
So her car was sort of across the street from where this bush is? A uh, little bit farther uh, to the west, uh, a little bit farther toward Livernois. Um, in other words, the bush, if from this angle, the bush I don't think would have been blocking it. I think we would have been able to see her car a little bit to the right. Okay. That's the, that's the general lay of where her car was that night. Yes, that's, well, that's what I remember it, yeah, in that general area, yep. Now, as you're, as you're walking Miss Montemore to her car that evening, um, it's dark out, correct? That's right. Okay. Um, can you bring up people's exhibit number four? Um, Judge Berg, this appeared to be the uh, photograph of the scene that night. Yes. And you can see uh, a little... Uh, a picture shifted a little bit to the left as you're looking at your house as opposed to the last picture, people's exhibit number three. Fair enough? I think that's right. Okay, if I were standing in Oak Drive looking kitty corner uh, to the front porch, not blocked by the view blocked by your tree, but this would be the front of your front porch, correct? Yes, you can see the front porch. Now, this picture is different than people's exhibit number three because there's snow and what appears to be ice on, on the sidewalks and on the lawn and the street, correct? Yes, okay. that's how it was that night. So when you walked this Montemore from your house that night, did you have to walk around the curb to her car? I think that we stayed on the sidewalk and then stepped stepped over the snow there into the street and walked her that way. As you're walking Miss Montemore to her car, you got into her car, correct? Yes. Did anything unusual happen between your house and Miss Montemore's car? Well, I remember that I did see a car that was parked in front of the, the house that would be on the other side of Clarita, which you, you can't really see it too well in this, in either one of those can pictures. You, can I show you people's exhibit number two? Yes. <coughs> okay, if this is Oak Drive, this is Clarita. Yes. You indicated that as you're walking Miss Montemore to her car on Oak Drive, you saw a car park somewhere? Yes, there was a car parked on Oak Drive a little bit farther down in front of that corner house that's across the street from our house there that's marked with the star. So it was the next house, if you move your little pointer down, uh, a little farther down, see that house right there on the corner of Oak Drive and Clarita across from ours. Right where the words on this diagram say Oak Drive? Uh, no. Uh, you want to judge one of these here. Okay. Push the red button there. Okay. Yeah. So here's our house, and those pictures that we were just looking at, that's looking at the house as if I'm standing where the dot is right now. That's looking at the front of the house. And the little bush that we were looking at, that's, oops, got a little smaller there, let's see, okay. Yeah, so the little bush we were looking at is right where I'm placing the dot right now. And now I'm placing the dot where Ms. Montemori's car was, Patty Montemori. So when I was walking her over to here where she, her car was, I saw a car parked here in front of this this house on Oak Drive. And there were two two individuals who were getting out of the car. I know the the uh, person that lives in this house. And I didn't know if it was someone visiting her or what was going on. I just took note that there were a couple of folks getting out of the car. That's all. Did you recognize those individuals as they're getting out of the car? No. Okay. Nothing unusual about two people parked on the street getting out of the car at the same time you're walking this Montemore to her car? No. Okay. Did you have any contact with them as you're walking this Montemore to her car? No, I thought nothing of it. Okay. So, um, you walk Ms. Montemore to her car, exchange pleasantries, does she leave? She does. Okay. I said goodbye, she drove off. Okay. After she drove off, what did you do? So then I walked back down that street, uh, right by the bush that we just saw in the picture, and you may have noticed that in one of the pictures there were some uh, trash cans that were in front of the house. It okay. was uh, Wednesday night. Oh no, Thursday, I guess it was Thursday night because the, the trash had already been picked up. Yeah, you see where those trash cans are in this exhibit here. Um, they were in about that same location. As I was coming back across Clarita, I noticed that they were there and that I needed to bring them in. So I uh, grabbed them. I actually decided to pull both of them at the same time, which if any of you have those, it's a little bit unwieldy to do that, but it can save you a little bit of time. And it, so it made a lot of noise as I was pulling them back. I pulled them down the sidewalk there. You can see the garage that's behind the house, and then there's a gate by the backyard, but the gate was locked, so I couldn't put them in the backyard. So I just left them there, and then I came walking back down Clarita toward the corner to turn back into our house. Just why don't you show us again? I'll push the red dot. 
show us where you, uh, the path you took to take the trash cans and where <coughs> the trash cans. Sure. So here's the trash cans. I came, I was over here uh, with Patty. She drove away. Then I walked over here and I saw the trash cans, grabbed the trash cans, mm -hmm. walked back down Clarita right about to here, put the trash cans there, and I walked back this way and then I turned and then I was going to go into the house. Our door was open this whole time with a storm door there so the light was actually on inside the house and you could you could see that you know the light was on. So you took the, the trash cans to the side of the house. Would you bring up number seven please? Uh, is this the side of your house sir uh, on Oak Drive there? Yes. And is this the location where you took the trash cans to that evening? Uh, yes, and it's hard to see, but that's one of the trash cans right there from what I can tell. Number eight, please. Yep, is there that it is. Picture of the trash cans? Yep, and you can see the recycling can there, the blue and the regular trash can there. So you didn't and that's the, that's the gate that was locked. That's the gate you didn't have the key to, and you had to leave the trash cans on the side. Right. Okay. All right. So you leave the trash cans. You walk back up the path of your house. Bring up number four, please. Four. <coughs> um. Judge Bird, did you walk around the sidewalk to the walkway of your house? Yes. So I I came back down Clarita, the sidewalk here on Clarita, turned here, and just as I was coming here, I saw these two guys coming from this direction from the north. Let me, let me stop there. Uh, for the record, you're pointing to exhibit number four, uh, the area on Oak Drive uh, just beyond your house on the sidewalk. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. The area beyond the, the stop sign that's depicted in people's exhibit number four. That's right. Okay. You indicated that you saw two individuals? Yes. So I was coming, I was just going to go back into the house, and I saw two guys walking toward me from the north, and I think I said something like, how you doing, or good evening, or something like that. And then I, whoops, did I do that? Sorry about that. And then I turned uh, and went up the walkway. And you indicated a moment ago that the, the 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 main door to your house was open that night. Yes. The screen door is closed. The screen. This it was a storm door with storm, door. storm glass in it. Okay. That was closed, but the the main door was open. Main door was open. And did you have your porch light on, if you recall? Porch light was on. So just as it appears in this photograph here, we're enlarging people's exhibit number four, <coughs> which depicts the front of your porch, correct? Yes. And in this photograph number four, you can see the porch light on. You can see through the storm door that's that's closed into the house, the, the foyer beyond there, correct? You can see that. that You can see that right there behind the door, yes. And that's the way it was as you're walking up the sidewalk, the walkway to your house, correct? Yes, that's okay. how it was. As you're walking up to the, uh, the porch of your house, what happens next? So as I was walking up the sidewalk, I could hear that the there were people coming up behind me. I could hear the footsteps somewhat quickly. And so I turned around and I said, what is it? And uh, one of them, there were two individuals, one of them said to me, uh, excuse me. Uh, and then he said, uh, we don't want to harm you. We just want you to let us into your house. When you turned around, you said you saw two individuals, is that That's correct? right, yes. Where were the individuals in relationship to you? So, I was at the foot of the porch right here, Good. and I Good. turned... I'm going to bring up uh, people's number five. Okay. Is this a depiction of your porch, uh, Judge Burke? Yes, okay. so that's the top of the porch, and then I, I think initially I was at the bottom of the porch when I turned around, and then he said, excuse me, we don't want to harm you, we just want you to let us in your house. And then I started to back up and get back up <coughs> onto the porch. So now I was all the way onto the porch and he came up onto the porch either with me or he may have been on this first step here. I can't really recall whether he was all the way on the porch with me or not. He may have been. Okay. When you turned around to face that individual the first time, how far away was he from you at that time? Initially when I turned around, they were probably about five or six feet away. And then as I backed up onto the porch, uh, the, the fellow who was speaking, he came up with me either all the way onto the porch or onto the first step there. 
When you say they were five to seven feet away, both um, both individuals were in the same area at that time? They were walking with one another, okay. and then the fellow who was talking to me uh, stepped ahead of the other fellow, and the, uh, the second fellow sort of hung back by the tree. So one fellow, uh, one person advances with you as you make your way to the porch, correct? That's right. And the second individual who sits uh, hung back by the tree, is that right? Yes, there's a brick border around the tree, and he was standing right next to the brick border. Judge, I'm going to hand you uh, People's Exhibit 337. And again, it's, it won't work on the monitor, but if you can just hold it up for the jury and show us. Oh, there it is. Oh, it's not too bad. That's fine. That's 337. The whole thing. Oops. Just the first one. Okay. That's not so bad. Okay. Um, you indicated that when you turned, the two individuals were five to seven feet behind you, correct? Yes. Okay. One advanced with you as you made your way to the porch, and the second individual stayed by the tree. Is that right, right. I remember the, the second individual standing somewhere around here. And for the record, you're pointing to People's Exhibit 337A, and you're depicting an area that's just north of the round um, surround of the tree. Is that correct? The yes. There, there's, a, there's a small brick border that goes around the tree about two feet high. And then he was the number two fellow. The guy who was standing behind was about right right where I'm putting the dot. Again, on the diagram on 337, right by the tree, right? Yes. Okay. So, and that, that, felt, that person stayed in that <coughs> location? Yes. Okay. The other person you indicated advanced with you toward the porch. Right. right. The other one was coming right up with me. Okay. And what did the person <coughs> say to you as he's walking with you up to the porch? Well, as I said, first he said, excuse me, we don't want to harm you. We just want you to let us into your house. And I wasn't really sure what was going on or whether it was a joke or I didn't know what was happening. And I just said, no, 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 like that, as, as if to say, I don't, you know, I don't agree with that. We just want you to let us into your house. I don't want to let you into my house. And then he said, we have a gun. And then he reached in his jacket and he pulled out a gun. Let me stop you there. The individual after you said no said, we have a gun, correct? Yes, he did. And is this the person that was advancing with you onto the porch? That's right. Okay. Are you facing him? I'm facing him. Is he facing you? He's facing me. How far away are you from that person at that point? Not very far. Probably two feet or three feet. Are you physically... He came a little bit closer. Okay. Physically, are you on the porch step? Do you know where you're at at that point? I think I'm all the way on the porch at this point. You He's either on the step just below me, or he's also on the porch with me. I, I really can't remember that for sure. You did something with your arms. You put your arms out and. and a yes, fashion. because. Well, let, me, let me stop you there. Okay. Did you did you make a gesture like that when you told him no? Yes, I put my hands out like this and said no. No, like for, that. For the record, the witness has, uh, was spreading both arms <coughs> um, across this, about equal with your waist. Yes, gesture that's right. Gesture. I didn't I didn't have them high in the air. I just had them at my sides. Okay. Palms open. Palms open. Yes, right. And when you had your arms, palms open, spread out of your waist, saying no, is that when that person said, we have a gun? Yes. Okay. What did you say when he said, we had a gun? I didn't say very much different than saying no. I said no again. He, he said, we have a gun. And then everything happened fairly quickly after that. I had my hands out at my sides. And I, I just sort of said, no, 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 okay. like that. Why did you do that? Because I didn't want him to come into the house, and I wanted to tell him I didn't agree with him coming into the house. Can, can you tell me why it is you didn't want him to come into the house? It may sound, it may sound like a silly question, but why? He had a gun. I was concerned that he might harm my family or me. And when you said no the last time, you indicated with a gesture with your right hand that the person pulled something across his body. Is that right? Yes. Would you, would you make that gesture what the person did with the gun and show the jury? Sure. He reached in almost in a, in a horizontal way, as I'm doing now, and pulled out a firearm like this. And, and for the record, uh, the witness is using his right arm 
to reach under his jacket, um, about the breast level area, and pulling out a gun at that time. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I noticed that he didn't, from, from what I saw, he didn't seem to reach down into his waistband or into a holster, or as I've seen sometimes with law enforcement officers, if they're at target practice and they have a holster, it was a different kind of emotion that seemed to go across his chest. At that point, are you still two feet away from him? Two or three feet. And you're facing him, he's facing you. That's right. And he pulls the gun out of his jacket, then what happens? Then, as I said, I had my arms at my sides. Mm -hmm. I think I started to step back and forth. I don't know if I was starting to lose my balance or just get worried at that point. And then the next thing I know, he just went bam and shot me in the leg. So you are two to three feet away from the person with the gun at that time, right? That's right. And you're facing him, he's facing you. Yes. You still have your arms spread uh, in, a, in a fashion to block him, correct? Correct. And he points the gun at you and pulled the trigger. He did. Did he say anything to you before he pointed the gun and pulled the trigger? Not that I recall. Okay. The gun that he produced the gun, can you, do you know the difference between a handgun and a rifle? Yes, I do. Um, was this a handgun or a rifle? It was a handgun. Okay. Are you familiar enough <coughs> with guns to know whether it was a... Uh, a semi-automatic or automatic or revolver type gun? It was a semi-automatic. And how do you know that? Because I have been exposed to firearms. I've been a prosecutor involving firearms. I've never owned a firearm, but I have, I know enough to know a semi-automatic when I see one. Can you, it can you describe the gun for us that you produced? Yes. It was an unusual looking gun to me in the sense that it was a large uh, semi-automatic, larger than what I usually see a law enforcement officer carry. Uh, instead of having a, rel a comparatively narrow uh, barrel, it seemed to have a wider barrel, uh, a wider side to it. There was, I could see the inscription, there was writing on the side of the firearm that was script writing. I couldn't exactly, I couldn't read it or didn't take the time to read it, but it looked like a, for lack of a better word, a fancy, a pretty fancy firearm more fancy than I normally see police officers carrying, and also a large firearm. So I knew that it was a big, big gun, that's all. After he shot you, what happened? After he shot me, I fell down onto my right hand uh, side, onto my hip, and they immediately ran. When you say they, what are you talking about? Uh, both of the individuals. The person. other guy was hanging out there the whole time, just sort of watching. So the number two person stayed by the tree the whole time, This the person who yes. was the gun and shot you? Yes. Okay. Did the number two person ever say anything to you? Not that I remember, no. Okay. So after you're shot, do you fall? I fell down onto my hip. I could tell that I was hit in my leg, in my knee area. I started <coughs> yelling, help, I've been shot, call 911. Do you see what happens to the two individuals? Yes, I could see them perfectly well. They took off running. They ran down to the car, the same car that I saw the two individuals get out of. And at that point, my wife came out onto the porch because she sheared me yelling. Uh, they got into the car and... So you're on the porch. You're lying on the porch. Yes. You're yelling for help. Call 911. You saw the two individuals leave your yard, correct? They ran. They ran. They ran in the direction toward Oaks Drive. Correct? They ran kind of toward Oak, yes, toward Oak Drive, toward Clarita, to the right where the car was. Did you see them get into a waiting car? Yes. And did you see that car pull away? I did. Okay. Now, at this, about this point, does uh, your wife, Nina Sevier, come out of the house? Yes. Okay. By the time she came out, they were not completely in the car yet. They were probably about 15, 10 feet away from the car. Can you describe to the jury how it was they left? They walked, they jogged. What? They took off full blast. They ran. They ran. Okay. So both individuals took off running. As soon as he shot, he ran. Shot, you fall, they run. Yes. Um, your wife, Ms. Sevier, comes out of the house. Is she on the porch in time to see them running away? She is. Okay. okay. And when she comes out to the porch, what happens next? Judge Burke? So she came out there. I was still yelling. I, I, I stopped yelling when she got there. And then I said, I've been shot. And, and she said, w she said, what? I said, that, that guy just shot me. And then she sees them, and then she yelled at them. 
Um, do you recall what it was that Ms. Sevier yelled at the individual as they were running away? I do remember, yes. Could you tell us? Well, she swore. Okay. And what did she say? She said, she yelled very loudly, you, you motherfuckers. To the individuals as they were running away? Yes, while they were getting in their car. Is that a common type of language that the Sevier, based on your experience, used? No, not at all. Okay. No. You're somewhat surprised that she would yell that as they're running away? Yes. Well, I'm surprised in the sense that she doesn't use that language, but she's she's a brave person, and I wasn't too surprised that she felt that way and that she was assertive under those circumstances. When she said that, did you say anything to her? I said, don't run after him. Why? Because she's been known to do that. And why did you not want her to run after him? I said, don't run after him because they have a gun. And one of them just shot. Right. Does she run after them? No, she didn't. What did she do? She called to my son to call 911. I think he might have already been calling 911. He brought her the phone, and then she spoke with the 911 folks. Now, as you're lying on the porch, can you bring up number five, please? As you're lying on the porch, Judge, um, people's number five, this is the approximate location of where you fell on the porch there? Uh, a little bit a little bit to the left uh, on this picture from what I can remember, but it's the general area. I think my, my legs would have been in the picture. Okay. Um, do, do other people start to come to, the, to your aid? Neighbors? Yes, it was pretty amazing. Uh, there, another, One neighbor was walking. We, he wasn't walking his dog. Actually, he had died, but usually he would be walking his dog. He was walking, and he came running over. And then our other neighbor, who's an ER doctor, came running over, too. So your neighbor happens to be an ER doctor? Yes. She came over and rendered assistance to you? She did. Okay. And... Um, you're lying on the porch, neighbors are attending you, your wife's on the phone, uh, your son may be on the phone calling 911. Is that correct? That's right. At some point, uh, Judge, do the police arrive? Yes. So the police, uh, you know, after she called 911, uh, fairly shortly we could hear the sirens, and uh, they got louder and louder, and the police came. When the police came, what happened next? Do you recall? They... They were responding to the situation. They were asking what was going on, asking for information. Uh, we were waiting for an ambulance to arrive. Uh, I don't really know how many minutes it was. It wasn't a lot of time. Uh, I was starting to get concerned that the ambulance wasn't there yet. I wasn't really bleeding or anything. There was no visible blood loss or anything happening, luckily. Uh, but I was still concerned, and so... The, I guess the officers just made a decision, took me in the back of the police car, and we went to Sinai Grace. So you were transported by the Detroit police officers who responded to the scene? That's exactly right. They put me in the back seat. And they drove you to Sinai Grace Hospital? Yes. And you were admitted and you were treated for your injuries? Yes? Yes, that's what happened. I want to show you people's exhibit number nine. Judge, do you recognize what that is lying on the, on the sidewalk, on the walkway? That's one of my running shoes. Um, do you know how it got there, if you know? No, I don't really know how that got there. I, I remember that when when Do when Tamar came, Doctor Tamar from across the street, uh, Jeff, she she um, I think she cut my jeans, and she may have taken off my shoe, or maybe my shoe was loose. I don't really remember what happened. I don't know how that shoe got there, frankly. That, that's your shoe lying on the walk. That's my shoe, but I don't know how exactly how it got there. Fair enough. Um, before we talk about what happened to the hospital, I want to talk to you about um, the individuals that were uh, involved in this robbery. Did, you, you indicated that there were two. Is that correct? Yes. Can you describe the one that came up to the porch with you with the gun? Uh, yes. Uh, he was a young man. Uh, he was, I would say, so. I thought between the ages of, let's say, 18 and 22, something like that. Um, he was a good-looking young man. He had a little bit of uh, facial hair, maybe like a goatee or something like that, uh, closely shaved. Uh, he had s something over his head like either a, a hoodie or a hat, but I didn't really get to see his hairstyle. Um, Can you describe his height? He was uh, medium to tall, I would say, medium to tall. I don't remember him being especially taller than I am. How tall are you? I'm 5'10" but he may have been on the lower step, in which case he, he might be taller than I am, but he seemed, when I was looking at him, we were pretty much looking each other right 
right at the same level. Um, and um, <coughs> can you describe uh, his race, please? He's an African American. You indicated a, a close crop goatee. You couldn't see the hairline. Correct? Right. Um, about your height, five ten or thereabouts, maybe yes. a little taller. Yes. How about weight? He was slender. They both were. Okay. How about the second individual? Can you describe him, please? He was an African American male as well. Uh, he, they were both wearing black clothing. Uh, he was farther away, so I couldn't really see his face as well. Uh, but uh, he he had some kind of a hat on. I think he had like a knit cap on, or something also covering his head. Um, at some point after you were released from the hospital, um, were you asked to go and look at some um, live lineups? Yes, and, and we saw a couple of those. A couple. How about how many did you attend? There were at least two, and. Uh, Another one or two times, I believe, where we went to go to a lineup, but it didn't happen, and either maybe it was a photo spread or maybe nothing happened. I can't really remember each incident, but there were a number of times when we came to can, can lineups. You describe, uh, just, can you describe the process you went through to look at the line, lineup? We went uh, to the jail, uh, and uh, they had a room, and they took us back in the room, and we... Uh, were shown a number of individuals standing and they asked us whether or not we recognized anybody. I say we, but we went one at a time. You're talking about you and your wife? That's right. You, you, you and she would go down together at the same interval to look along? <coughs> yes. Okay, but you would do it individually? That's right. Okay. Um, now, can you describe the conditions, sir? Um, was it good lighting conditions? Did you see really well the array of people? No. I, I remember commenting at the time that it was dark uh, we were looking through, I guess, a one-way mirror, and I asked, can't they turn on the lights back there? It seems pretty dark. Uh, but they said it was something about the mirror that if we, they made it too bright back there, then they would be able to see the people or something to that effect. Do you have any difficulty seeing the faces or the individuals behind that mirror? I had difficulty. I don't want to say it was impossible, but it wasn't the best lighting. Um. Can I put the witness wrong? Sure. Any of people's proposed exhibits number 388 and 3... Three thirty nine and three thirty eight. So I'm going to hand you those two exhibits. I take a look at those. Are those photographs? Uh, yes. And they do they appear to depict uh, a lineup array um, similar to the one that you saw? Yes, it looks like the same the same basic setup and the same uh, the same kind of lighting. This is even a little bit worse than what it looked, but okay. yeah. Okay. Um, I want to go back to um, your admittance to the hospital, Judge, if I can. Uh, um, Mr. Moran, can, <coughs> can I interrupt? Yes, um, you're transitioning to another I area. I want to give my court reporter just a short break. Sure. Let's take 10 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Step into the jury room and uh, judge will be right back. Thank you. All rise.
Thank you. 